This video is sponsored by Lark. What if I told you we could solve all of our fresh drinking water problems and produce enough battery materials to build hundreds of thousands of EVs every day, all without any mining at all? Water makes up 71% of the Earth's surface, which is great because it's fundamental for all life on this planet. But there's a problem. Roughly 97% of that is salt water in our oceans. The remaining 3% is fresh water, but it gets worse. 69% of that is stored as ice largely at the poles. So it's a small wonder there's any fresh water at all. Luckily, it's a really big planet. But why can't we just drink salt water? I mean, it's not as tasty as fresh water, but surely we could make it work, right? No. <laughs> And here's why. Water makes up about 70% of the mass of the trillions of cells in your body. But if you get dehydrated, that percentage goes down and bad things happen. When you drink pure, clean water, the water concentration is higher outside your cell. And through a process called osmosis to reach equilibrium, water passes through the cell membrane, leaving you hydrated. But when you drink salt water, even though the bulk of water in your body is higher, the water concentration is actually lower than inside your cell. So no matter how much salt water you drink, osmosis will force fresh water inside your cells outside to help reach a water concentration equilibrium. Oh, science, you cruel mistress. It's truly a case of water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. The problem has gotten worse and worse over time as we keep pumping fresh water from underground aquifers for our various needs like drinking water and water for irrigating crops at a rate faster than nature can replenish it from sources like rain. This is basically the problem we have in all aspects of our environment. With billions of people each needing copious amounts of water and other resources, we're using more than we put back and it's just a matter of time before we run out. Humans use about 4 trillion cubic meters of fresh water annually, enough to fill the entire Grand Canyon to the brim. Agriculture alone can consume between 75 and 90 percent of a region's water supply. But at least in the case of fresh water, engineering and technology have provided us a solution. It's called desalination, and it's a process of extracting the salt out of salt water, yielding pure, clean drinking water. Technically, we could have desalination plants along all of our coasts, producing clean water to pump back into our lakes and aquifers. So why don't we? Why isn't every country building desalination plants as fast as they possibly can? After all, many project that the wars of tomorrow could be fought over clean water, not oil or other resources. To understand why desalination isn't more popular today, let's start with the evolution of the technology. The principle is actually relatively simple. Get the salt out of the water, but in practice, it can pose a bit of a challenge. See, salt water dissolves easily in water, and when it does, it forms strong chemical bonds which are very difficult to break. So with desalination, there are two broad categories. The more old school method is thermal desalination, essentially boiling water into vapor and leaving the salt behind. Prior to the 1980s, over 84% of all desalinated water around the world went through this process. But there are a couple of problems with thermal desalination. For one, water has a very high latent heat of vaporization. That is the amount of energy required to turn liquid water into a gas. This stubbornness is hugely valuable as water becomes a great temperature buffer and a very stable liquid most of the time. But it also makes boiling water really difficult. So to boil seawater and separate it from the salt requires a lot of energy. That power often derives from burning fossil fuels, which, you know, contribute to climate change. The second issue relates to the byproduct of desalination, a thick, goopy, salty, watery mixture called brine. This intense concentration of salt and other minerals is often pumped back into the ocean as facilities generally have no use for it. Then it sinks to the sea floor where it wreaks havoc on ecosystems by destroying oxygen levels while also obviously spiking salt content. The more modern method of desalination is membrane-based desalination, often called reverse osmosis. Remember osmosis from earlier, how our cells hydrate? Here, salty water is forced through an extremely fine membrane that separates the water from the salt and other impurities, like pouring your pasta into a fine mesh sieve to let it drain, but at a microscopic level. In general, reverse osmosis solves many of the issues associated with thermal desalination. The process is cheaper and more efficient. Advances in membrane technology require less pressure and therefore less energy to filter the water, making them generally greener. Still, even the process of reverse osmosis can be energy intensive. An RO facility in Kuwait expends more than 889 gigawatt hours annually purifying their water. It's an expense the country is happy to fund, as obviously water is a vital resource. However, if not for their massive oil revenues, it's likely that a country like Kuwait could not be able to make such an investment. We have to 
start seeing clean water for the precious resource it is. That's why I'm thrilled with our sponsor this week, Lark. I talk a lot about what I love, but you know what I hate? Plastic one-time use water bottles. The solution is purifying water at the source. While you've probably seen a picture like this before, what makes Lark unique is its PureViz technology that baths your pitcher and water in UVC light cleaning itself every two hours. You ever notice how your old water filter has a smell after a couple of weeks? Well, that's what that UVC light will fix. This means Lark eradicates up to 99.9999% of bacteria, not to mention lead, chlorine, mercury, cadmium, copper, zinc, and VOCs. There's even a smartphone app that tells you how much water you're drinking, when the system needs to be recharged, and when the filters need to be replaced. I use my Lark pitcher every day, but my favorite product is this their Lark filtered bottle. I used to struggle avoiding plastic water bottles on travel, but now I can fill up anywhere. Subscribe for automatic filter replacements, take the guesswork out of clean drinking water, and save over $500 a year on plastic water bottles, not to mention all that landfill. Check out the awesome line of Lark products using our link in the description. Huge thanks to Lark and you for supporting the companies that support this show. Not every country has rich resources to export. But there is a third option currently under development that may soon make its debut in one of the most innovative, if controversial, city projects in history. Introducing Neom City. This sprawling megacity will cover over 10,000 square miles or nearly 25,000 square kilometers of the Red Sea coast in the northwestern province of Tabuk, Saudi Arabia. Equal in size to 33 Manhattans, the sheer scale of this project is dwarfed only by its share of controversy, which I think is a topic for another day. The city is designed to integrate renewable and sustainable technology at every level of its infrastructure, creating a complete circular resource economy. Cloud seeding technology to produce artificial clouds, a Jurassic Park style island with actual robotic dinosaurs, and over two thirds of the land allocated to natural growth so that nature will only be a five minute drive from the metropolis. The city will also be completely independent of existing state energy systems, providing 100% of its power from renewable sources. But what's most impressive is how this futuristic utopia plans to provide water to its many residents in the middle of a scorching desert with no natural fresh water. In general, Saudi Arabia is home to the 10 largest desalination plants in the world, ranging from 600,000 to 1 million metric tons and providing water to 50% of the region's population. Neom's water solution, however, applies an entirely new approach to desalination in line with the city's general philosophy of energy conservation and renewal. The process is technically a thermal plant, but instead of deriving power from fossil fuels, the system will harness the power of the sun. The structure will consist of a massive hydrological sphere, basically a huge dome made of glass and steel. Seawater flows into the dome where it gets heated by parabolic mirrors placed around the sphere capturing sunlight and focusing them into the dome to vaporize the water. As water vaporizes, it leaves the salt behind and then precipitates back down as fresh water. Being located adjacent to the Red Sea, the facility can produce loads of fresh water without consuming any electricity or producing any greenhouse gas emissions. Well, except for the massive pumps, they'll have to pump this water around. But still, a massive reduction in energy. And the leftover brine? The plan is to extract leftover salt concentrate, then process it to obtain useful substances. Here's a list of various elements found in the ocean and their concentrations measured by parts per million. I want to bring your attention near the bottom of the list to these elements that we can use for either energy, like thorium and uranium, and also battery materials like lithium, nickel, and cobalt. This synergy of producing fresh drinking water and finding amazing applications of these trace elements of huge importance around the world will be what pushes this technology forward. The estimated 16,000 operational desalination plants located across 177 countries generate roughly 95 million cubic meters of fresh water every day. Assuming the same density as pure water, that's more than 100 million tons of salt water processed every day, enough to extract 10 million kilograms of lithium, enough to build 142,000 Tesla Model 3s every day. Yeah, the sooner we stop seeing this as a waste product and seeing it as a gold mine, the sooner desalination projects around the world will ramp up. Meanwhile, Neo's system only uses 100% renewable energy, but it doesn't stop there. The city's infrastructure is designed to repurpose any potential wastewater, which will be fully processed to generate electricity, fertilizer, and reusable fresh water for irrigation. The goal is to achieve zero waste and a circular waste economy to inspire other global leaders. 
In addition, the water filtration process could eventually lead to hydrogen fuel production on site as well, which has been touted by many, including us, as a possible game changer in the future of energy. Things like hydrogen fuel cell boats and airplanes. As we mentioned, Neom City has faced a lot of controversy, and we aren't exactly proponents of the concept until a full assessment of its impact is established. But using solar energy and parabolic mirrors to heat and desalinate water can be studied and applied by any country around the world, especially in arid regions near oceans where water is scarce. This technology is new and largely unproven. As such, there is a whole host of questions to consider. How much will it cost to create a solar thermal desalination plant? How much maintenance will be required? And how will levelized operating costs per unit of clean water compare to other forms of desalination? So to answer the question that we asked at the very beginning, why aren't desalination plants everywhere? Well, there are 16,000 in operation today, which is probably more than you were thinking, but it still pales in comparison to how many we probably need going forward. And why we don't have more, it just comes down to cost. The cost of desalinating water currently is really high. But what if we could change that around and make this a goldmine opportunity to get raw materials from our oceans, produce clean drinking water, all powered by the sun? And I think that's exactly why this is an absolute game changer. And only time will tell how this plays out. But I really do hope that a lot more countries around the world start to invest in this sort of technology. One thing is for sure, the opportunity is massive and the need is dire. Let's not wait until a dystopian future where wars are waged for clean drinking water. Let's start getting clever about some new solutions today. And while we're at it, let's consider the whole cradle to grave aspect of this operation. It's not good enough to dump this highly damaging brine back into our oceans. We need to do better. We must do better. But what do you guys think? Is desalination the way forward to resolve global water shortages? Are you ready to book a room in Neom City? Let us know in the comments below. But before you go, we have just enough time for the comments of the week. This one comes from Groaznik. He says, bro, shave. I don't know what it is about my face that warrants this level of attention from people about shaving, but maybe I will. We'll see. You'll have to tune in and subscribe. And that one is in regard to our wind turbine recycling video, which we'll have a link to here. And the second one, is from our Is Solar Worth It five years ago video. Lou says, thumbnail, five years later. Video date, five years ago. You're right, Lou. We'll have a link to the original video from five years ago and also the new one that we made from 10 years later. But that five years ago solar panel video was what spurred this entire channel. It was our first hit video and it kind of made this channel what it is today. Thanks so much for watching. Check out our other videos and we'll catch you guys next week.